Hi everyone, this is Andrew at Plainview Farm. It's kind of a rainy, nasty day here in southern Missouri, so I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk to everyone about one of my favorite topics, electricity. And what I mean by that is the fencing system that I believe has made barbed wire obsolete in many, if not most, fencing situations. I recently did a video about how I'll never build another barbed wire fence if I don't have to. And I think that video kind of made some folks upset. If you look at the comments, you'll see that there's a lot of people that really like barbed wire fence. And if you like barbed wire, that's fine. Use barbed wire. I know it's worked for 150 years and it's still effective today. And just because it's been around for 150 years and it still works today, doesn't mean that there aren't better options in at least some specific situations. So like I said, if you like barbed wire and barbed wire works for you, keep using barbed wire. But if you're interested in something else like high tensile electric, I'm going to show you today how I build a high tensile electric fence. There are some tools and supplies that you'll need for the job, but only some of them are required. You can find a full list on my website, plainview.farm. One of the first tools you're going to need is a spinning jenny, which holds the spool of wire and allows you to dispense it quickly and easily. I built mine out of scrap metal, uh, just pieces of stuff that I had laying around. You can find a spinning jenny relatively cheap a hundred dollars or so in a lot of different places. Most farm stores these days have them. You're also going to need a decent set of wire cutters. Twelve and a half gauge high tensile wire is pretty tough and it can dull a cheap set of snips or side cutters pretty quickly. Other than that, your basic tools are going to do the job. One of the tools that I really like to use is a story pole or a story stick. It's a one by one piece of treated lumber that I've marked out my wire heights on and it saves me a few steps when it comes to setting my wire heights on my corner posts and my first few T-posts. As far as supplies go, you're going to need end insulators, line insulators, T-post clips, strainers, one per wire, and some sort of wire splice. Now everyone has a different opinion whenever it comes to line insulators, so my best advice to you is just find one that you like and use that. Me personally, I prefer lock jaws. I used to use pin lock insulators pretty much exclusively, but I got tired of replacing broken pins whenever a deer or something would run into the wire and cause the pin to snap off. One of the reasons that I like the lock jaws is the same reason that some other people don't, and that's whenever a deer or some other animal will hit the fence, it can cause the lock jaw insulator to pop off of the T-post. And in my experience, I would rather be able to just pop the insulator back on instead of having to replace it. One other thing I'll add about insulators is that black and white insulators tend to last longer and be less susceptible to UV degradation than some of the more brightly colored insulators. I'm really not sure why this is, haven't done a whole lot of research into it, but the gentleman that taught me how to build an electric fence some 12, 15 years ago, he gave me that advice and so far it's not failed me. As for the fence itself, what I'm talking about in this video is a seven strand high tensile electric fence that alternates between hot and ground wires. And this fence is 48 inches tall and the wires are spaced at 48, 40, 32, 24, 18, 12, and six inches off the ground. Again, they alternate between hot and ground starting at the top. So there are four wires that are hot and three wires that are not. And the reason that I build my fences this way is because it holds every kind of animal that I like to keep, whether it's cows, donkeys, uh, goats, or pigs. And another reason that I like to space my wires so close at the bottom is that it keeps predators out or the neighbor's dogs if they might want to snack on a baby goat or a chicken. Once I have my corner post marked with the story pole or the story stick, I drive my fence steeples or staples if you don't know what they're actually called. I'm just kidding. But seriously, I've always heard that they're called steeples if you drive them with a hammer, and they're called staples if you shoot them with a gun. So, anyway, whatever you call them, it's fine. So I drive the fence steeples where I made my marks so they can hold the wire in place. And it's important to note that you should not drive the steeple down tight on the wire. The wire needs to be able to move underneath the steeple. If you drive it down tight, you're going to end up creating a weak spot that may end up leading to a failure in the future. The next thing I do is drill a hole for the screw-in insulators and then I tighten them down. You don't have to drill a hole, uh, but I just find it's easier to do so. In this instance, I forgot to grab a drill bit, but I did have a screw in the truck, so I use that instead. Hey, whatever works, right? Once I get all of this initial prep work done, I pull the top wire. 
I thread the wire through an inline strainer, and a decent quality strainer is going to have a hole at the end that allows you to thread the wire straight through it, so you don't have to cut the wire, and this ultimately makes the fence stronger. The spinning jenny turns as I pull the wire, and this is one area where high tensile runs circles around barbed wire, because I can pull this high tensile wire through almost any obstacle with virtually no resistance. Once I reach the end of the pool, I tie an end insulator to a post using a short piece of wire, then I tie the wire to the insulator. I thread the wire through the insulator, then bend a kind of handle onto the end, wrap it seven or eight times around itself. Now I don't use any fancy knots whenever I tie off my wire because at the end of the day you shouldn't be putting so much strain on your fence that you're pulling your tie offs apart. High tensile wire is meant to be firm, but it's also meant to be springy. That way if something runs into it, the wire can actually flex and then pop back into place. Let me show you what I mean. In the event that something does hit your wire, the only thing that should break is maybe a line insulator. Or, like I said, in the case of the lock jaws, they may pop off the post. One of the things I always do is leave about 55 inches or so of the top wire hanging loose after I pull it through the insulator, and I'll show you why in a bit. Once everything is tied off, I tighten up the strainer and put some tension on the fence so that I can start everyone's favorite part of fence building, and that's driving T-posts during a drought in rocky Missouri soil. I generally space my posts about 20 to 25 feet apart, and I know there are some people that go longer or shorter than that uh, for whatever reason, but 20 to 25 feet generally works for me given the way that the ground lays here on my farm. I use that top wire to line up my T-posts and once I get them started I'll lean against the wire or put something on it to hold it out of the way so I don't actually damage it with the post driver. It really is no fun to nick the wire against one of those studs on the side of the T-post. If that happens you can either splice it or put in a whole new wire so it's best to just get the wire out of the way. One quick side note, if the T-post keeps twisting as you drive it, you can put your foot against the blade to keep it straight. If that doesn't work, a good pipe wrench will twist it back straight once you get it driven. Just put the pipe wrench around the bottom of the post as close to the ground as you can and pull it back to where you want it to be. Now, yes, I understand the post will be twisted, but it's a little bit easier on your insulators if they're all straight. And I'll tell you this, I'm one of those people that it's going to bother me if a post isn't straight. In fact, there's one right over here next to the house that isn't straight and it's driving me crazy. I'm sure I'm the only person in the world that cares about it, but it bothers me for some reason. Anyway, once I get my post driven, I grab my insulators in the story pole and get the top wire secured to the post. Next, I pull the second wire. Since I'm alternating between hot and ground wires, I only need to use a strainer uh, on the second wire. There's no insulators necessary. I just tie them off to the corner post where I put my steeples, then I secure them to the T-post with regular old T-post clips. Again, using the story pole is really just to get my spacing right. So unfortunately the wind picked up and I wasn't able to complete the process of building this fence or at least complete the process of recording myself building this fence. But I will walk you through the final steps and uh, show you the finished project. So I pulled the other five wires the same way that I did the first two, and I alternated the spacing of the strainers. Um, that way it would reduce the likelihood of them getting caught up on each other. Because you know, if something can happen, it probably will, so might as well take some precautions. Now if you remember, I said before that I always leave about 55 inches or so of that top wire hanging loose. And here's where that's important. I use that piece of the top wire to connect the other four hot wires. I pull it down using a section of insulated electric fence tubing to protect it from the ground wires and connect it to a small piece of wire that I left on each strand using cable clamps. You can get actual connectors for high tensile wire, but I find that I can buy bulk uh, cable clamps just as cheap or cheaper than, uh, than the actual uh, fence splicers. And they're also supposed to be galvanized. So I guess it really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, use whatever works best for you. Once I get all of those hot wires connected, I also splice all of the ground wires. And actually, I was just talking about those electric fence splices, and I've got a handful of them here that I used in this section of fence, so you can see what they look like. 
Now you don't have to splice in all of the ground wires and tie those into the Energizer's grounding system for it to work, but I do it because it ensures that the livestock are going to get a good shock no matter what they do. If they try to stick their head between two wires, uh, they're going to get a shock no matter how dry the soil might be. This is one of those things that really tends to be an issue with goats because their feet don't always make really good contact with the ground. So if they touch a hot wire, they may never feel a shock. Something else I also do is I have ground rods at different places around my farm uh, along my perimeter fence that I tie those ground wires into as well. Again, that's just for a little extra insurance. At the end of the day, there's not a whole lot to it. It's one of those things that's a lot like many others. Once you get the process down and you find out what works best for you, you'll get more efficient, you'll get quicker at it. And really what this is ultimately about is what works best for you on your farm. I'm not telling you that this is the only type of fence that you should ever build. I'm just telling you why it's the only type of fence that I'm going to build. Unless there's some sort of very specific circumstances that require me to do otherwise. So if you have any comments or questions, feel free to share them below. Again, this is Andrew at Plainview Farm. We'll see you next time.